But first up, let's talk to Daniel Hannan, Conservative MEP for South East England, a leading a Leave campaigner who joins us now. Good morning to you, Daniel. Good morning to you. Um, the, the Prime Minister made a lot of promises when she spoke at the 1922 Committee of Backbench MPs uh, on Wednesday, ahead of that crucial vote on her leadership. And the, she basically said well, a number of things. She was going to leave. Uh, before the 2022 general election, a deadline date. But she also said that she was confident she could persuade the European Union to grant fresh concessions on her withdrawal agreement. She was told it had to be something legal. It had to be changes to the legal text. And she was confident that would happen. However, it's emerged now that uh, the uh, European Council President, Donald Tusk, had told her on Tuesday, the day before, that absolutely there would be no such concessions. Um, are you hopeful she's going to get them now? No. I mean, she hasn't been any good at doing this. It, it may be a question of sort of lack of personal chemistry or, or lack of charisma with the EU, or it may be, which I think is likely, that the EU wants to keep us in a customs union because it is incredibly advantageous to them to have Britain as a captive market for EU exporters, not facing any competition from the rest of the world, and to be able to use Britain's market, the fifth biggest in the world, as a negotiating chip when they do trade deals with third countries, wholly for the benefit of the other 27. So I, I think the reason that the EU will not grant a an exit clause from the customs union is precisely because it represents such a, a disastrous deal for us and such an attractive one for them. But this is, we're told, again, since so all the Irish backstop is this crucial issue. Again, I, I just simply don't believe that it's a crucial issue. Everyone has agreed on all sides, the Irish, the British and the EU, that no one wants a hard border. No one's prepared to put in a hard border. A hard border's not going to happen. Everyone knows that. It's being used as a, a, a cunning whiz to keep us in. But but the, the, re, the reality is... Um, Unless the legal text can be changed on that, is it that your view that Tory MPs, the DUP, those crucial 10 uh, votes that uh, the Prime Minister needs to get anything through if the opposition opposes it, uh, will never give in on this unless she gets the legal text on that changed? Uh, and, and frankly, now, even if she were to get legal changes, it, unless it, uh, it were a complete replacement of the backstop, uh, unless we were just to say, look, let's junk that that whole thing and, and just have a British-Irish treaty to the effect that there won't be any new border infrastructure and, and forget this whole thing about keeping Britain in a customs union. But, I, I mean, forget that with this Prime Minister. And that leads us to a very awkward and rather depressing situation in Parliament. There's no majority for voting for this deal. We, we've seen that. Uh, the, the, there'd be a, a three-figure majority against it. Uh, there's also, I suspect in Parliament, no majority for leaving without a deal. Now, that may happen accidentally, but I think it is unlikely. And so I'm afraid that for the first time, uh, for the first time in, in 30 months, I've started to think that it is now likely that either Parliament will technically reverse Brexit, in other words, uh, will have a referendum offering a choice between Theresa May's deal, which everyone is against, and Remain, but where there's, if you like, no leave option on the ballot paper, or where they will simply extend Article 50 and then negotiate to stay in, in all but name. Either way, I think we should be clear about what we're dealing with. The biggest vote in British history will have been overturned by a coalition of politicians civil servants and some cartel politically connected businesses. Anyone who had any doubt about whether there was still such a thing as the British establishment, your eyes will have been opened now. They will have won again as they do every time. There's a lot of talk uh, among Leave supporters, other prominent, uh, not just politicians, but business people and others that I speak to, not just on air, but off air, that, that we do need to, the 52% representatives do need to begin to prepare for a second referendum. But it, I mean, the, 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 the clock is against the Remain camp or the Ramon camp. Most Remainers accept, gave their vote honestly and accept and respect the outcome of the vote. Uh, we are talking about a tiny minority of people who don't. Um, unfortunately, they vote. It's a tiny minority who are not a minority in Parliament. No, I was just going to say Initially, exactly about my point I was going to make. Right. But, I mean, but you're absolutely right. In the real world, I'm sure lots of your listeners voted Remain and a decent Democrat and Patriots said, OK, that was, you know, let's get on with it. And there were all sorts of avenues available to us where we could have come to a compromise solution that would have satisfied most of the, the desires of the 52% and most of the concerns of the 48%. There were lots of ways we could have done that over the past two and a half years. The only chance, though, of doing something like that, I'm afraid, went up in smoke at the beginning of this week because it's clear that Theresa May is, is tied to her particular version. 
the one that she says she believes in with every fibre of her being, and it's clear that there is no majority for that. So I'm afraid I think it is now looking like a, a referendum which is rigged in the most obvious sense, that the choice presented to people on the ballot paper will not be between leave and remain, but will be between Theresa May's deal, which most Eurosceptics, including me, regard as the worst possible outcome, worse than either staying or leaving, or uh, remaining on the, the terms that we were two years ago. In other words, leave will not have anyone to vote for. There won't be an option there. And so I think in that situation, when you say, should we be preparing for a second referendum, I don't see that we would have any option except to organize a mass boycott. I think the uh, correct yes. attitude would be to say, do you know what? You all promised absolutely clearly last time, especially you Remainers, especially John Major and Nick Clegg, that there'd never be another vote, that this was it, that we were never going to come back to it. Do you know what? We're not going to play this game where you make it best of five, best of seven, a regular test. We are not going to legitimize this process with our votes. We have already voted. And I think what you'd then find is that we had a sort of Albanian type outcome where you had, you know, 99% remain vote on a, you know, turnout of less than 40%. It would solve nothing. And this is the issue, isn't it? All the solutions, whether Prime Minister says it's whether replacing her, or whether it's a general election after a vote of confidence in the House of Commons, uh, or it's a, uh, a second referendum, none of these actually realistically resolve anything. Because even if there were a second referendum and Leave was on the ballot and Leave won by 65% uh, next time round, um, it, that would still not resolve things, would it? Because we've well, still not got. With this Prime Minister. I mean, I, I think there was a chance. Of, because, I mean, to, to be honest, the, this particular model of only caring about border control and being prepared to sacrifice everything else, including sovereignty, because of this obsession with ending free movement, I don't think that that view is shared by any other member of the cabinet. I think that is a, uh, a particular view of Theresa May. Uh, and that is the problem, because she's come back with a deal that sacrifices everything else with only that one achievement. And I think, like some Remainers, she may have actually come to believe by the end of the campaign that this was the only issue for Leave voters, or she may have thought that all Leave voters shared her own obsession with the issue, I don't know. But the reality is there was never any chance that most Leavers were going to vote for a deal in Parliament or in the country that left us effectively with all of the current obligations of EU membership, but without any vo uh, voice or any veto over, over new legislation, in exchange only for ending free movement. That was, that was not what we voted for. What we voted for was self-government. What we voted for was to be an independent country again, not to be uh, a, a kind of colony of the EU that just happened to have a protocol giving us stronger border control. Do you see any circumstance, any scenario in which we are going to fully leave? You could argue that the clock is, is uh, although it's being used by a weapon, or attempting to be used by a weapon uh, by the Prime Minister, uh, by running the clock down, the next vote won't be until you know a month's time, mm. and, oh, we're just that bit closer to leaving. Can we risk a no deal? And we're not really preparing enough. And again, if you don't prepare enough, you've never prepared enough. Uh, it's a self, self-inflicted wound there. But can you see any scenario where actually the clock works in our favour? Currently, as it stands, according to an Act of Parliament, unless there is another Act of Parliament that supersedes it, we are leaving the EU on the 29th of March. Sure, that is now the least bad option. Um, but it, it, it would have been much better to have had an agreed and amicable withdrawal. And I think as recently as this week, there was the prospect of getting a different prime minister who'd have been able to go to the EU with a different proposition and say, look, we are just not going to sign this backstop. No British Parliament is going to vote for it. Uh, we can agree to most of the rest, but here, you know, let's uh, let's have a conversation about the overall shape of that. And I think that a new PM who the EU hadn't clocked to someone who who would sign anything put in front of them might have been able to turn that around. Uh, but I don't think Theresa May had any a, any intention to do that. And as we've seen last night. Uh, she hasn't been able to get even cosmetic changes, um, possibly because the chemistry is so bad. I mean, I, I think one of the, 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 the problems, to be honest, is uh, she's not a naturally uh, good negotiator. You know, she tends to kind of read from briefs and, and, and repeat her, her rather labored talking points. And, uh, you know, I think other world leaders are not used to that. And, and somebody knew they might have given... Uh, a warmer reception to, but that, that door has now been closed. I, ironically, do you know the person who probably could have negotiated this? Uh, Tony Blair. And if he wasn't a Ramona in chief, he would have been fabulous on our side on this one. Uh, Daniel Hannan, thank you very much for talking to us, Conservative MEP in, for the southeast of England.